All right, buckle up, kids. We're going to cover a lot of territory today, from negotiating with the Taliban to promoting sustainability through internal initiatives and supply chains and addressing modern day slavery and needing to do this so just you can get financed and more. This is going to be a wide ranging conversation touching on issues you didn't even know you need to know, but you do. Uh, today's guest has led a fascinating life as an engaged in a fascinating business as well. Raul Chandran is the managing partner of Upswing Solutions. Welcome to the spotlight. Thanks so much for having me, Warren. Looking forward to this conversation. Oh, it's a pleasure. I've been looking forward to it for a while. Um, with you, I was sort of I was sitting here thinking about the podcast and going, where do I start? Do I start with a business? Do I start with him? Because it's been it, we had such a fascinating pre-conversation. And I think it'd be good to just because it leads so nicely into what the business does um, to just talk a little bit about your background and how you got here. Um, Cause you didn't, you didn't start, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you started in, uh, in some other areas, although with an entrepreneurial bent. So can you just, you know, do the origin story, like the superheroes. Um, it's, it's a lot smaller than a superhero origin story. I started right here on this planet. Uh, but I actually did start, one of my very first jobs was as working for a startup when I was a kid at home and my brother was far away in school and we used to type up cricket scorecards on the internet. That became a company that eventually got invested in by Mick Jagger, bought out by ESPN and still operates to this day, Crick Info. Uh, and that sort of lit a bug, both of entrepreneurship, but also just of reaching people. Because we would get these yes. emails. I was I was the junior, junior kid, so I don't want to claim any serious influence over the long-term average. But we would get these emails from people all over the planet who were so excited um, just to be in contact. And you felt sort of that you were making a difference. So first company, there were a couple of other non- uh, I got to stop you there because some, oh. someone's going to write to me and ask, did you, meet, did you meet Mick Jagger? I didn't get to meet Mick Jagger. Other people got to meet Mick Jagger and uh, by all accounts, he's pretty cool. Yeah, and I was, very passionate about his cricket. Ah, nice. There you go. Um, there was another startup, uh, Rely Software Supply Chain Software, that sort of taught me about really the dark workings of the world, which is something that I'll come back to, how goods move and where they move. I grew up in Hong Kong, which is a major transshipment port. And so it just showed me in the late 90s how world supply chains were connected to each other in ways that people really had no idea. Uh, and then a little bit all of a sudden, I switched to the United Nations. And I stayed at the United Nations for a while, two years in Afghanistan from 2002 to 2004. So how did um, I just stop being there? Like, how does somebody just switch to the United Nations? Like, that's not, you know, doing supply chain, dealing with Mick Jagger, and then switching to the United Nations. That isn't something one just sort of gets up one morning and does. I mean, it's sort of a terrible story in that I got a phone call from a guy who was in Kabul. It was right after the fall of the... Taliban and the, you know, after 9-11, I'd lived in, I was living in New York at the time, and he'd read something that I had written, and he said something to me along the lines of, would you like to come and work in Afghanistan? And I said, yes. And this was before there were internet scams, but not entirely clear to me that this was a real thing. You know, it's not every day someone calls you, says, I'm on a satellite phone in Kabul, do you want to come to Afghanistan? The right answer seemed like yes. Uh, I think it was nine days later, I landed in Kabul in June 2002. Uh, the airport was bombed out. There were landmines and sort of burnt out planes on the runway. And, and yeah, there I was. Uh, I think I was willing to say yes at the right place at the right time, which is, I think, a, a very good life policy for people. If you're not sure what you want to do and someone offers you something and it sounds interesting, just say yes. I've done that a lot. And it's, it's paid off in spades and sometimes in some hard lessons that have been worthwhile as well. So I, I, had, stayed in I had one of those where I, I didn't say yes, and I must say I didn't regret it. I was in northern Thailand, and uh, there was a guy who hung out where I did who was a Thai police officer who was on the border patrol, and he asked me if I wanted to go on a border patrol with him into the jungle, which I was immediately prone to say, yes, that sounds exciting. And then he goes, but you'll have to carry a gun. And I said, why? He goes, in case we run into any rebels. And I thought, 
who's going to lose that fight? <laughs> so yeah. I, I didn't say yes, but I digress. I digress. Now, so I've had a lovely career and I've, I've run into a few rebel groups, but I've always been on the side of the people without guns. Um, so I've never had to quite have that conversation. So I worked in and out around the United Nations for 10 to 15 years. Um, and, you know, it started with Afghanistan, expanded to post-conflict work, and then grew into sustainable development more broadly. So the UN passed the sustainable development goals in 2015, uh, and I ended up leading a think tank for the Secretary General uh, to figure out what that meant and how we were going to do this and what, what it was for the world to achieve sustainability and what our little part as the United Nations family was in that journey. And so how, how did, sorry, that work was in Afghanistan or did that go? No, that was all, that was mostly in New York. I mean, there was a lot of travel okay. between then and New York. I'm, I'm skipping a few years for, to yeah. save our listeners' patience. Uh, but I ended up in the sustainability file just before when we were thinking about sustainable development and really intensely after the SDGs were passed, after the sustainable development goals were passed. Uh, trying to think about how the UN could do that and what that meant in terms of working with cities and working with companies and working with countries around the world because everyone was at a different starting place uh, and had a lot of facets on a really complex journey. And so mm -hmm. how do we understand where we can actually help them, what you can do to help all of the people get there? And so what kind of initiatives, if you can give an example, were you were you playing with? And the first one was actually right after the passage of the SDGs was to work with something called the Chief Executives Board just to figure out, okay, we've passed these SDGs. There are a lot of them. What do they mean? And how do we actually do it? And how do we reckon with all of the targets they have and start to simplify, clarify, and prioritize? And I'll and say just that in case what someone doesn't know, SDG stands for Sustainable Development Goals. That's right. And I'll say to you, at the time, and afterwards, I was a little bit of a skeptic. And as I've worked more and more, my journey to sustainability has continued. What I've seen is that those goals really did succeed in inspiring people and empowering people by giving them a framework to which they could aspire. So it didn't say, you must do this and do this now. It said, here's a lot of things that need to get done. And if you can hang your hat on one or two of them and contribute, you're doing something positive for the world. And over time, I saw more and more companies, but even, I think most compellingly, groups of young people who are really quite passionate about the SDGs, about mm -hmm. the ideas that they contain, and are willing to say, which I think is the right thing, I can't do everything. I'm not going to solve all of the planet's problems, but I'm going to work on gender equity. I'm going to work on poverty, I'm going to work on food, I'm going to work on a specific issue, and even within a corporate setting, I'm going to help my company become better at that. Um, and so I, I translated, which is funny, when I was working on them, I was a skeptic, and now that I no longer work at the United Nations and have any oversight um, or role, I'm a believer. Hmm. Nice. And so you were at the UN until when? Hmm. I was at the UN until... Very now. I want to say 2017, was it 2018? I left and I led a global alliance scaling up innovation in the worst circumstances. So there are a lot of emergencies around the world, and we were just aware in those countries we weren't going to reach the SDGs. And in order to reach them, in order to achieve these objectives and really build sustainability into these economies, we had to embrace innovation and embrace innovation at scale. So I spent a couple of years uh, leading that global alliance. Uh, and then I shifted to work for an organization called Care Impact Partners. And Care Impact Partners was a social business, is a social business still. Um, I helped set it up that worked with massive MNCs, so with Targets and Walmarts and Gaps and the Cormix and other sort of companies that you see every day and that are on your shelves uh, to help them make their supply chains more sustainable. And it was really taking this idea that, that I think that crystallized through the SDG process, that there was no way just to achieve this at the policy level. It took deep, dark work in supply chains. Who's growing what? How are they growing it? And how do we find ways to work with those communities to make it happen better? Because if it's, whether it's the t-shirt on your back or it's the food in your pantry, 
there's a complex supply chain behind it. And at the bottom of that complex supply chain are often the poorest people in the poorest countries. And so how do we make their lives better? And how do we reach back and drive sustainability, both from the top down and from the bottom? Now, there's a this will be a question that sort of permeates probably a lot of the rest of what we're going to talk about, but is interesting. Like you just, you just said, Oh, I work for this company that helped, you know, so the supply chains with these large companies. Um, Cynics will immediately pop up and go, well, wait a second. What the heck is motivating the gap or McCormick's or any of these brands? Like why would they have engaged care impact to work on this? Like clearly if you're talking about dealing with the poorest part of the supply chain, there's got to be some cost implications. So what's, what would make um, Walmart or Gap or some of them reach out to you and say, hmm, can you help us with this? Yeah, look, it's a great question. And I I don't want to pretend that everything is perfect in all of the companies. It's not. A lot of companies are on journeys. A lot of companies have small groups of people within that company who are deeply passionate about that journey and trying to get the company on that journey. Um, and McCormick's probably the best example. One of my favorite people that I had the privilege of working with was uh, Michael Okoroafor, who was the chief sustainability officer at McCormick. And his mother was a single mother and a smallholder farmer in Nigeria. So this wasn't an abstract question of over there, there are some people and they are struggling with these supply chains. McCormick is the world's largest, I think, flavor company. But, you know, most people look at their pantries, there's a McCormick spice in there somewhere, odds are. Um, And so they were really committed to trying to find a way to transform their supply chains. But as they grappled with it, they understood that this wasn't going to happen overnight. They ran a business, they couldn't change everything. It's a very, agriculture is a funny business. You buy some of what somebody grows, but you don't own the land, control all of the things that people are growing. So you can't change the life of a community almost by fiat. I think sometimes people say, well, if these communities just, if these companies just did X, everything would change. And the answer is, unfortunately, it's not that simple. It doesn't mean all the companies want to do all the right things all the right time. They do want to make profit. Um, But McCormick was really committed to building purpose-led performance throughout everything it did. KPIs, dashboards for senior executives, uh, linking all of their performance to the SDGs, to sustainable development goals, and really figuring out for its key products, its most its five iconic spices, it called them, uh, how to change the way these things were grown so that the families lived better lives and that there was more sustainability. And to their great credit, to pay attention to gender equity issues in supply chains, which very few people were willing to do at that stage. So, There's reason to be skeptical. I think you should always look at big companies uh, with a critical eye. But I think you should also, it behooves people to look at it with a hopeful eye and start to say, well, if I'm looking at this, is this evidence purely of the company not doing all that it could do? Or does this also show me a story of change and of hope and that there are people out there and in these companies who are trying to do the right things and trying to figure it out, you know? For all the years I've worked in it, I don't have all the answers. Like we, we were out there, we had teams in the fields and in, in multiple countries trying to solve, okay, who's actually harvesting the rice? How are they harvesting the rice? How might you reduce fertilizer use? It's actually the women who harvest the rice. One of the many challenges is the tools that women use to harvest rice are designed for men because no one pays enough attention to understand that women are doing the work. There are all, so there's all kinds of layers to this that you have to unpack to Mm -hmm. get it right. But if you're willing to do the work, there are always people who are willing to go on that journey. And so you were with Care Impact for how long? Uh, For a couple of years. And I was in Canada and because I was here through the pandemic. And as you know, uh, travel was hard uh, to Mm -hmm. put it mildly. And so I hadn't seen my team and I hadn't seen uh, being able to travel out uh, where we were doing most of our work in these countries. And uh, I left Care Impact Partners uh, with a lot of love. I have a lot of affection for the team and the work that they do still. And I joined Export Development Canada, where I was the vice president for ESG policy, environmental, mm-hmm. social, and governance policy. And I helped Export Development Canada pass a suite of policies around 
climate risk and human rights risk. So a set, new set of board approved policies were passed uh, at EDC to improve, I think, the quality and the diligence, the way they pay attention to that work for all their transactions. And then I joined Upswing Solutions as the manager. And so what, what prompted that transition? Um, I guess that so from government to a private enterprise. Well, to be honest, I've been trying to recruit someone from Upswing to work for me, and, and they turned around and recruited me. <laughs> and, <laughs> Turn around is yeah. fair play. Yeah, no, no it, and it's been a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful journey. You know, Upswing is a small, scrappy company, right? Trying to really make a difference and drive impact and deliver change for its clients. And it's a wonderful. So what team does Upswing do? So who are who who are you at Upswing and who do you serve and what do you try to do for them? So Upswing focuses mostly on the Canadian market and it's the Canadian I'd say mid to large cap firms. So firms with market caps of ten billion dollars and then all the way down and then we do a fair amount of work with crown cores. So uh, we've worked for the federal government for Environment and Climate Change Canada. We did a review of the federal sustainable development strategy. What could it learn from the private sector and what could it teach the private sector? We've worked with the Port of Halifax, sort of a major piece of Canadian infrastructure to try and look to the future and understand what are the implications for sustainability for 50 year plan and that's 2050 plan. So the port has a long-term horizon plan. How does it integrate sustainability into that in a strategic and thoughtful way that also engages in particular with the indigenous communities around the port? Uh, we work for companies large and small. I can't rain many of my clients without their consent, but you know them, you buy from them if you're in Canada. Um, and we're helping a lot of people, frankly, to get started on their journey. So what we see is a lot of clients who will come to us and they'll say, well, look, we, we have a mandate to do this. And then there's that slight awkward hesitation. But what do we do? How do we actually do this? Because the mandates come in at policy or the exec table says, we want to improve our performance on sustainability. But it's never that easy. All the, all the dimensions of sustainability are linked. They interact with each other. You can't change your environmental performance without affecting the way you procure, without altering or changing, shifting your human rights commitments often if you have complex mm -hmm. supply chains. And so, so you have to think about these things. Uh, I mean, they come from, so there's Bill S-211, which is the Modern Slavery Act and Forced Labor Act in Canada. Uh, just passed and actually the new, it passed last year and the reports that that mandated were released on the internet today at Public Safety Canada. Um, and so companies were obligated to report on the risks of modern slavery in the supply chains and what they were doing about it. Uh, and so they had to document and understand that. But these are the same companies that are also on net zero journeys or they're trying to decarbonize their supply chains or address scope three emissions without that full net zero commitment. Maybe they have signed up to SPTI, the science-based targets initiative, it's the same supply chain behind both. The supply chain that you're worried about in modern slavery is the supply chain you're starting to decarbonize, right? It's the same suppliers. Okay, so and so that, I'm sure there are some people going, modern what? Say what? What do you yeah, what are you modern about? slavery and forced labor? So it's a thing that often surprises people. Modern slavery is present in Canada. It's very present in Canada. The estimates are that there are is it twelve to twenty thousand, depending on whose estimate you're looking people living in modern slavery in Canada. A lot of that occurs with migrant workers, and people assume that migrant workers receive the same labor protections as Canadians, and they do not. Uh, and so there have been a lot of notorious cases. I think the most famous one was Jamaican farm workers who wrote a letter to their minister of agriculture and labor saying, we're being treated like mules, we're punished when we don't perform enough, we're physically abused. And that was happening in Canada on Canadian soil. So it's it's common-ish in agriculture, certainly a lot more common than people would like to, to acknowledge. It's also very common in the United States. Uh, so there's been a series of articles in the New York Times and the New Yorker about this, about how the child, the social audit programs, which is when companies pay 
third parties to go and look at factories and certify that there are no children working simply do not work. Um, I think the headline of the Times was $2 billion in audits fail to find child labor where it's obvious. And it was a photo of a 13-year-old. I think he was putting eggs into egg crates. But there were stories of children on the supply chains of Cheerios and Oreos. You know, this isn't small, obscure things. This is mainline commercial scale production where you're seeing children employed in the factories in the United States. So it's in, in Canada, it's in the US, it's in Europe. There was a great review by Oxfam of the wine supply chain in Italy, which found that, you know, 100% of the workers in Piedmont, which is a major wine producing region in Italy, didn't know about the minimum wage. And that there was a hotline for complaints about child labor, about labor, forced labor, but it was only available to Italian speaking members of the union. So that's not very useful if your product is being picked by migrant workers. So this isn't something that is happening over. People sort of think of farms far away where children are being forced into labor. It's not a farm far away. It's the Cheerios uh, packaging factory in Michigan, right? It's uh, onion farms in Canada and elsewhere. It's 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 a really prevalent problem, and it's. A really and so what what would make the audits unsuccessful? Is it corruption or incompetence or something else? Like, I can just imagine, like, when I first heard this, I was shocked. Um, and I'm sure other people listening to this would go, say what? Like, how in Canada and the United States in 2024 can there still be child labor going on? Like, how? And if, you know, you and I are sitting here having a conversation knowing about it, certainly people in law enforcement must know about it. So how is this still going on? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think we've learned as a society over the last thousands of years of social organization, simply saying to people, you shouldn't do this, doesn't stop people from doing it, whatever that is. Um, and so it's a combination of the enforcement and the social sanction. And I think what we've seen is we've seen some enforcement, not great, not consistent, not reliable. And frankly, uh, again, even in Canada, uh, institutions of government have been implicated in human rights abuses. So there was a case where I think it was the Ontario Human Rights Court found the police guilty because uh, a crime had been committed and they went and swept all the migrant workers and collected their DNA and treated them in a way that they would never be able to can you imagine the police coming into a town and saying, someone got hurt in a fight? We're taking the DNA of every single person in this town to figure out who was responsible. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not acceptable. It's not even legal, but it's happening. So there are challenges with relying on the institutions of power to enforce this. But I think also it's it's incumbent upon us, on consumers and just everyday individuals, to actually care. So people may hear this, and they may hear, hmm, there's modern slavery involved in the production of Cheerios. How many people will stop buying Cheerios or will take action about that and will say, oh, that's really wrong. We should have less modern slavery. But are we willing to act upon it? And that, I think, is the challenge. Um, when people think it's far away, and they've been conditioned to think of it as an abstract other country problem. And somehow the other, if it's other people, it doesn't matter as much as it's our people to mean children. Children have that right to go to school. They're just as childlike everywhere. Children are the same. They're fun mm -hmm. and sometimes slightly annoying, like my own beloved children Every in every country you go to. They should all get to go to school and play and be free and not obligated to work in the fields. I was listening to a podcast about Egyptian jasmine workers. You know, the world's most luxurious perfumes use jasmine that is picked by children late at night crawling through the mud. Um, and they have to, you know, there's no protection from the pesticides in the jasmine. Everyone knows it's happening. No one is, is, is willing to take the steps to commit to the action and consumers aren't signaling to companies that they care enough to force companies to change their practices there are people in a lot of companies who do care and are trying to change things it's not all bleak 
But I don't think it's also fair to put the responsibility squarely on others. I think in a lot of cases, we do have to look at ourselves and say, so what am I going to do with my own life? And then how am I going to vote, advocate, push for systems that make sure that everyone's children get treated the way I want my own children? And so it's, I said there was a bit of a theme, and so I, I almost asked the question again, like if may, maybe I'm blind, maybe I'm being you know too kind to myself, but I would think that if I was the CEO of a company and I discovered that there were children working in my factory after hours, that I would be on the phone to somebody that afternoon going, what the F? And <laughs> it's this now. Like, how is... Again, like, and, and I guess the disconnect for me is so there's people who are hiring you, like you learned about this because you've been hired to help people clean up their supply chains. So on the one hand, you've got someone saying, yeah, we're going to hire this company to help us do this. And then learning that it's happening, not just like damn the torpedoes and let's fix this. Yeah, I mean, I think the challenge is around the way we price reputational risk. Right. Is, is that's the way the conversation goes in, inside a corporate shop is what's the rep risk that it's used from being at it being discovered that these things are happening. And the answer is that the, co- the reputational hit to companies is not as severe as an average human thinks when they first read the story. And the stories have been, if you go and list, look at sort of any news source, the stories on modern slavery, you know, from onions to nitrile gloves to chocolate to Cheerios to Oreos and everything in between, there's a story that's been written. And you can read the story and you wonder, well, has the company had consequences? And the answers are, generally speaking, no. Right? There have not been significant consequences for companies that have that's been such found a disheartening, to have. That's such a disheartening calculus. Like even the fact that it's done as a calculus, right? Like learning that there is a child working in a factory, I shouldn't give a rat's behind whether it damages my sales or not. That's just not something that should be happening. And I think we're, I think so. I'm an eternal incorrigible optimist. Um, You know, it's too early in my life, hopefully to say eternal. Um, But I, I think that you are seeing new forms of business emerge that allow people to express those values clearly, when that, whether that's the cause or for benefits or even the employer and trusts that are emerging in Canada as a result of new federal legislation, tax laws. Um, that's a whole nother podcast probably. But yeah. you're, seeing, you're seeing a movement to create the space for people to say, hey, I actually want my company to strictly comply with this set of core values and we really care about it. And I think that a lot of companies are also seeing um, generations of the next generation of workers really start to take some of this on. And I don't actually just mean the very young. I think some of the very young, frankly, are growing up in such a challenging economic environment that a lot of people have their heads down and they're focused on what's in front of them. But there are a lot of people who've been at work for five, 10 years who sort of established themselves and understand what they're doing. And now as they're making choices, they are conscious of the way those choices resonate emotionally with themselves and the way that business lives that value. And one of the great examples of this is there was a very famous case in Tamil Nadu. Sorry, in there? uh, In Tamil Nadu in India, in South Mm -hmm. India where there was a factory, Eastman Exports, that was uh, a worker was killed essentially by a foreman after having complained. U.S. Customs stopped the imports from the company. And in many cases, you might think the story would end there. But what happened is uh, a number of companies, PVH, uh, Gap, a U.S.-based NGO and others, worked with the labor union in the country to set up a series of reporting and grievance mechanisms and protection for the women in the factory. And that factory has since become the employer of choice. It has lower turnover. It has lower, uh, I forget the term in in apparel manufacturer all of a sudden, 
as a term for when you met your rejection rate essentially of mismanufactured materials. And if you have high turnover, your rejection rate is higher, so your input costs are higher. So it's become a positive for business, positive for recruitment and retention, uh, positive for, for the bottom line moment to have labor rights respected and understood. And it's taken sort of a, a real piece of global action to help bring that about, like led by this workers' union of Tamil Nadu. So you're seeing people organize themselves around the world and demand better conditions. And the occasions where companies are doing the right things, they're learning that this can make good business sense. So I think there are positive, that, you know, there's, there's a direction of travel that's positive. There's a long way to go. I don't want to pretend it's all easy, but there is there is a growing body of evidence that this is the right way to do business is the good way. The companies that hire you, um, is it all just out of goodness of heart or there are some other financial and regulatory incentives that are encouraging uh, encouraging them to engage you? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, there's laws in Canada, there's um, requirements for... Uh, GHG emissions disclosure. So a lot of firms have made net zero commitments and then they have to measure their emissions and figure out how to reduce them. A lot of firms are connected to international supply chains. So if you're selling into Europe right now, uh, you know, I don't know what the hard number is, but somewhere between 10 and 20% of every RFP is about a sustainability scoring mechanism. So companies in Canada that want to sell to Europe need to know their emissions and document their emissions and explain how they're reducing them. Uh, if you want to get financed by big banks or you want to get access to cross-border finance in the US or international finance at scale, there's increasingly requirements to document your climate risk because there's climate risk portfolio level requirements for the very big banks. And that's from where the money flows and so and that's just and that's not to be that's not all government required that's now becoming sort of market influenced isn't it that the, the the capital is seeing risk associated with sustainability and so they're to protect their own capital are requiring people to have superior improved disclosure Correct. and you're seeing for example the financial times for those who read it have been running a series on uh, insurance risk and how insurers are increasingly concerned about climate risk and about the aggregate impact of what we'll call smaller events. So insurers used to only look at what's the giant hurricane going to do, or the massive flood. But now they're understanding that, you know, 57 wildfires can do as much damage as one earthquake, right? When you start to add them up, and if the wildfires are happening every week, hey, that is serious risk. It's bottom line risk. Uh, and it's a very good good sign, I suppose. It's a worrying sign in sense of the climate, but it's a very good sign for those who care about sustainability because if the insurance companies are saying, we want to understand what you're doing to mitigate your emissions because we're not going to insure you if you're not taking the right steps. And if you're not aware of the physical risk that climate change poses to your assets, companies have to respond to that. No one's going to go around with uninsured business. It's going to it's not. This is one of the. This is one of those, uh, you know, side, side notes. I love just what your take is on it in terms of what the discussions are within the organizations. But when I hear people, you know, on the one hand, denying climate change and saying it's sort of a left wing conspiracy, and yet insurance companies, which are among the most conservative of institutions, are baking climate change into their actuarial assessments, uh, that you. How do you actually square that circle? Yeah, it's not just that they're baking it in. They're coming, and I think it was uh, Munich Re, which is now the world's largest reinsurer, said that, quote, unquote, roughly, unquote, we underestimated the effects, the quantitative effect of climate risk in our models, and so our models need to increase their estimates of the damage caused by climate change. Right? So it's it's not even sort of a soft push. It's like a... There's mathematics around this, you know, there are ARM, the big risk modelers can map the inundation risk. Once they start changing the baselines because heavier rainfall due to a warmer atmosphere is a real quantifiable, measurable thing. You know, individuals can hold their own beliefs if they want on what, what is happening. The insurance industry doesn't care about your belief. It cares about the quantitative measure of the amount of water that it feels is likely to fall on the given location and what that's going to do to the property. And that's going to set the insurance rates 
So to some degree, it's setting aside that argument. I don't believe in climate change. I'm opposed to anthropogenic climate change. Climate change is natural and saying, this is a problem. It creates risks. How are we going to manage those risks? Right. And that is sometimes separate from the emissions reductions, but not always. Yeah, because even right now, like I think you said something that to the effect in a previous conversation that if like if you have a physical asset in Western Canada, you're you basically have to take into account climate risk now because your your physical assets are at risk because of wildfire. Yeah, and you need to be thinking about that and thinking about that on a 10 year time frame, right? Because if you're you're a publicly traded company with a physical asset, frankly, anywhere in Canada, you're saying you can't You can no longer say in good faith, I think, to your shareholders, well, you know, this year there's a 1% chance of fire damage, so we're not paying any attention. Because all of them know that if you look over the last 10-year period, five-year period, there's clearly a risk that is real and manifest, and so they're going to look and expect disclosure of those risks. Now, the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions has this regulation, OSFI B15, violence, which says, hey, people, the big banks have to think about this. The federally regulated financial institutions must be thinking seriously about climate risk. They're the people providing the lines of credit, the working capital facilities to all of those companies. So it's it's just, it, it's coming from the finance, it's coming from the insurance, and frankly, it's coming from the fires and the communities. It's real. It's there. So I think people are starting to pay attention. I think it's a struggle to figure out how to pay that attention. There aren't enough sustainability professionals. Um, It's all a little expensive, frankly, which is, it's tough for companies. I'm I'm somewhat sympathetic, right? Uh, We're in a high interest rate environment. Cash isn't free. Um, The economy is uncertain on the horizon, as well as is, perhaps. Uh, So how do you scale up that expenditure to really understand your climate risk and really get granular? then mm-hmm. how do you disclose that to your shareholders? But I think, and you know, I'm sure I own some shares in some companies. Um, I think shareholders are going to ask companies questions, and that generally takes the form of lawsuits if companies aren't thinking about that. Right? If companies say, well, there's no problem, and stuff happens as it will, and as I think is pretty predictable at this point, that smells like shareholder lawsuit to me. Right. And so people engage. So just at a more detailed level, what does upswing do? So people are dealing with, we want to track modern slavery. We want to get our supply chains better. But, you know, I'm a mid-level manager and the CEO has tasked me with trying to make us compliant either with financial requirements or regulatory requirements. And so we reach out to you to do what? I'm a CFO of a a billion-dollar company, not a small company. But there's no sustainability team. You're pretty busy. You're in the operational weeds. That's what your company does. And you know that you have to disclose something. And so how do you get started? Right? Because it's it all just seems too much. And that uh, that really, I think, is 80% of our work for a lot of people is what's the first step? How do I reduce and simplify what sounds like of how am I going to fix my supply chain and decarbonize my emissions and meet my disclosure requirements? That was we're going to slow all of that down. We're going to say, okay, we're going to get there, but we're going to start here. We're going to start by figuring out what are you doing? What are you emitting? What's in your supply chain and where might those risks be? And, and bit by bit, you're going to make progress. And if you, and I, I that's my general belief, I'm not a lawyer or a communications person. I think that if companies are genuinely making steps and moving on the trajectory of tackling these issues, There will be patience and space, both from regulators and from citizens around, you know, citizens of Canada and communities in Canada who can see and say, okay, yeah, I get that this is hard. I get that you don't know how to solve this. We, no one knows how to electrify their entire logistics fleet. How do you do that if you're uh, moving cold chain vaccines that have to be refrigerated? There might not be an instant solution for everyone. But as long as you're saying, well, okay, so this is my problem, and I'm going to try and figure it out. Here are some other things that I know that I can solve, so I'm going to solve for those first while I figure out that problem. I think that that 
is going to work. And that is where I think we're, we're also having a lot of conversations with companies that they have to get used to a different model of talking about sustainability. Not sort of a, hey, this is great and we're great and everyone's great and you should love me. It's more, hey, this is hard. We're really trying. Here's what we're trying to do. And here's what we don't know how to do. Here's where there's some risks that we don't really understand yet, but we are trying. And if that's true, if that's good faith, I think that, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I assume that that is a defensible position for those putative shareholder lawsuits. But it's also important for the public and for just your sense of business ethics, right? Like, hey, we're trying to do this. We don't know how. That's okay. It's really hard. We don't know how. No one has figured out how to build a sustainable economy, a perfectly sustainable economy yet. So it's a and journey. So do, you, do you come in and like just give, not, I don't mean just as in simple, but do you just give a report or are you in there consulting on a weekly, monthly basis to help them execute? Uh, are you connecting so, to other technologies or providers? Yes, to all of the above. What I mean, we have a really great team. I'm very, very lucky to have the people I work with. Uh, who have real operational experience inside institutions doing it. And so, you know, the way I did at Export Development Canada or other companies in the way that, you know, one of my uh, key people, Michelle Albanese, was uh, around sustainable procurement at TD before she joined Upswing. And so these aren't questions that are sort of, hey, we're consultants, here's a piece of paper, it's got a shiny picture. We've done it. We've sat in the supply chains. We're willing to sit with you. So sometimes it's, slow and painful and meticulous and sort of let's get down to you know which trucks are going where with what and why and how do we do something about it but it's also what does your board need to know what are the decisions that your c-suite needs to make how do you get that ball rolling on this journey in a safe way and you have to i think increasingly in sustainability be able to play at both those levels at the executive level to secure the understanding of the space and frankly the investment the work needs but then you have to connect that to operations there's no longer a use for just a shiny glossy report that doesn't do anything and doesn't hold water in, in, in the public eye there's enough ngos and others who are going to scrutinize that and say but hang on you're not actually doing anything this is just this is a postcard right and so we we do a lot of both. We're small. We're not, but there are some very large sustainability consulting firms. There are some engineering experts if you're trying to retrofit the inside of your building um, and sort of figure out which cladding to use. We're probably not the people. But if you're sitting there saying, I have buildings that should I retrofit them or should I? what should I worry about? That's more where we come in. And then we'll connect you, as you said, to the right people with make a very specific technical decision. We have some technical people, but we don't have a huge, uh, huge volume of them on staff because it's expensive and our clients are often budget limited. Right. So you, you said you're a small team. What are the, mm -hmm. this sounds like from a, a market landscape perspective, if there's increasing regulation, increasing need, increasing concern about this an issue, those are, those are criteria for a potentially growing market. Um, how does that, Matt, like what are your strategic or resource constraints or challenges to, to tackle that kind of growing market opportunity? It's a great, a great question. I mean, look, we're a small Canadian business. We're a woman-owned business and a B Corps and all of those things. Um, and that's a good thing. And it also means that we are subject to the, uh, I would say, economy-wide challenges that smaller businesses face with respect to capital in Canada. So there's a lot of capital in Canada. Um, but there's not a lot of capital that is really easy to access in an efficient way if you're a small business. Right. So I think there are absolutely, there's an economic infrastructure challenge around that. And you know, there's a PhD in there somewhere. Um, I can only tell you it's harder for us to find the money in the ways that we need it without understanding what the systemic constraints are on that or why they exist. I mean, is it just systemic? Like one of the things I've, I've had a number of conversations with people who've accessed capital north of the border, south of the border, and it feels like it's not just systemic, it's also cultural. Like there seems to be something in Canada 
where you know you hear all the time you can get 10 million dollars in the states but to get five hundred thousand dollars in canada it takes like six times as long and 20 times the the paperwork it's a risk appetite right i mean i, th I think it is easier to find capital outside um you know i think that there is there's a lot of room for a greater, a better approach to risk in Canada, but I think that we're in many ways a conservative society in mm -hmm. terms of if it hasn't been done before, there isn't a huge appetite for people to stick their necks out and do it differently. Yeah, there there isn't that appetite to do. There is not that appetite in the way that in the U.S. there's. You know, it's possible that the pendulum has swung sort of a little bit too far where, God forbid, you do something the way that somebody else did it, even though it's working perfectly fine, just invent a new company, call it an app, take $3 billion in venture capital, and then you figure out that it was working perfectly fine the way it used to. Somewhere is a happy medium, you know, is that, I don't know what that is, is that Michigan, Vermont? <laughs> <laughs> sort of not quite as not 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 all the way to California, but not quite as conservative as as Canada appears to be. I think a lot of that I'll be candid here is um, the institutions of power have not iterated on mass in the way that Canada has. So Canada is diverse, full stop. Like there's no way around it. A significant portion of the population is foreign born and it will be greater than it is now. And so there are immigrants and languages and connections to the world in Canada in a way that is a profound opportunity for Canada. Um, if you look at our politics, they're pretty inclusive, right? Parliament is really inclusive. This cabinet is really diverse. It looks like the Canada of the future. If you look at the institutions a couple of steps below that, they don't, right? Mm. That is, I'll call that the Bank of Canada. You go to the Bank of Canada and you scroll down the web page for its executive leadership team, and it's almost comedic, right? <laughs> How is it possible in this day and age that there is that the Bank of Canada doesn't look like Canada of 10 years ago, let alone Canada of 10 years into the future? And so I think that there is still a lot of work to be done to become not more inclusive in an abstract sense, to become more Canadian. Canadian institutions of power need to look like Canada does now. And if they're going to be the institutions that steer us into the future, they need to be looking like Canada will look in 10 years so that they're ready and fit to meet us there. And I think that change, whenever and however that change happens, and it has been slower here than it has in the US, um, I think that will change a lot of things because I think that the the idea that people are inherently risky because of their identity, not the quality of their business or their business uh, business plan, will vanish. Right, mm -hmm. and I think I think that a lot of the so I think there are a lot of constraints, but I think the institutions of power need to change, and it really is a conversation about power. And I think that that is a conversation that has become very fraught, unfortunately, and I worry that. Instead of continuing to evolve, we're going to see a retreat. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's an entire. Maybe that's another podcast as well. Yeah, that could, probably could be. I'm I'm fascinated by that because I, I think actually, and it's one of the reasons I love the world of entrepreneurship because it's it's a far more innovative environment, um, and power is it's not institutionalized to the same degree. Um, no, and I'll I'll give you there's some. Uh, you know, there's a sort of young, maybe young, is a, a man named Eric Aguiman in Ottawa who's building an immigrant entrepreneurship fund to invest in immigrant entrepreneurs. And I met him when he was starting it and he was talking to me about it. And I was surprised that we don't have this here and surprised when he showed me the statistics about the access to capital for entrepreneurs and the, of, of immigrants people of color and women. And we're starting to do better on the women's side, but we're not doing better on those. And there's all this talk about Canada and the world, and we need to connect Canada to the world. Canadians are connected to the world. There are people here from everywhere. You want to set up a trading relationship? You know, I go down the road from where I live in Ottawa, and there are a couple of grocery stores, and they have everything on the planet. So things are moving. 
And people don't see that small stuff as an opportunity to scale. I look at that small stuff and I think, that tells me that this could work. We just need to get more money flowing, get more investment flowing, make this all possible. There's a lot of opportunity. Yeah. Huge amount of opportunity. I'm not, I'm not negative in Canada. I'm positive in Canada. I have a number of clients who have like relations and connections to lots of, and you can just see their supply chains are atypical, but highly efficient. Highly efficient. And they're, they're doing interesting things and they're bringing change and that's, that will make Canada, you know, stronger and better in the long run. It's a wonderful thing. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm really optimistic because I think that change will happen. Um, I just think, you know, it's almost like we need some risk in the institutions of power. And I'm, I'm actually specifically not calling out the political class because it's weird. Our, you know, parliament looks like Canada in a wonderful way on both sides, on all of the sides of the house. There's a mm. lot more diversity. But the institutions don't look like, they don't look like parliament, right? That could be the threshold. Right. That's interesting. Now, on just in terms of your own business or business challenges, like it sounds like, you know, you're a very smart guy. Sounds like you're attracting some smart people. But is there not some? But is there is there a growth constraint in terms of the availability of people who just have the the capacity to do the kind of work that you do? Like, there's not a ton of people I would suspect who could walk in and do supply chain evaluations for Walmart to address modern day slavery and sustainability. It's not like there's, uh, you know. Rotman's isn't pumping out a hundred grads in that area every year. No, they're pumping. It's pumping out a few. Um, it's getting better. I mean, the challenge is I want the experience in house, right? Um, that's more valuable to me than what I call just consulting. Consulting is right. also very valuable, but I think there's always a set of learning that you get when you're responsible for an actual operation. Um, it is fantastic. It's like when you run a small business for the first time and, you know, I meet lots of small business, small business owners sort of socially. And there's a little look that anyone running a small business gives somebody else about payroll <laughs> and sort of just, you learn a lot of things about reality and operations that allow you to add greater value when they have that experience. So I think that we're, we're going to see a lot more people coming on the market because companies are grappling with this. And all the people who were through my work on a daily basis in five years' time, and many of them now, many of them more than I do, frankly, um, are going to be looking for ways to add more value and add more impact. And that's going to be great. It's going to be great for Canada. It's hopefully going to be good for us, too. Right. Now, just as an aside, you, you mentioned this is a woman's own, woman-owned business as well. So you're not... That's not you. I'm, I'm the managing partner. My, the founder, Alison Murray, set up Upswing six years ago, I think, uh, maybe five and a half. Um, and, you know, was a sole practitioner to sort of grew the firm its first little bit and then brought me in. Uh, but worked in sustainability for a number of major international companies, DHL and T-Mobile and others. Um, and so has in Australia and in the UK has sort of real operational experiences in sustainability in that decision making uh, process. And so that sort of she owns the majority of the business still, uh, which is great. Like I love working for a woman. I'm proud of it. Um, but yeah, going back to your capital thing, if I may, it's easier probably for us to go south of the border to raise capital than visible than it is for right. women. It is to stay here. Like, I, yeah. there's a lot of talk about why Canadian firms get bought out by American firms. And the answer is because they can, right? And I think that if you if you want to raise funds and you run around here, and it sort of feels like a lot more work than if you run around south. Like, yeah, tell me your idea. Let's talk. Um, it's it's so there, there's there's a lot of opportunity again in Canada for Canadian investment in Canada. But I think. That's why I think the place is going to do really well in the next 10 years. Right. If we get a few and so what's, uh, what's next for Upswing? Are you, are you, you're at the helm as the managing partner. What's your, uh, what's your direction? Where are you going to take the firm? Steady state growth. I, I'm not sort of... The model for Upswing isn't we get to 1,000 people and compete with the big four. The model is more... 
we become a trusted partner to more and more firms over the long term. We have a few companies that we've worked with now, multiple years of really deep engagements, and that's really what I want to build. A stable, steady, successful partnership that really drives impact. Um, so, you know, I'd love to look back and say, yeah, we're we're doing well and we're making a profit, but also we're actually transforming supply chains. And, you know, and I think we're getting there. There's a little bit of a whisper about us in a few places, which is really nice. We get a few calls from clients that say, I was talking to someone, they told us that you were able to actually not just get their report out, but really figure out what they should do next. I love that. That's what makes me proud. Nice. And does there, I mean, I always, I avoid uh, getting deep into politics on here because I think there's, it's too easy to yeah. to go left and right. And I think the, the issues are much more interesting than that. But to the extent that there is a, um, a possibility of like, the, the climate conversation, for instance, is is quite polarizing. Um, if there's a change in government, I'm just the reason I'm curious about this because you described you described it as as there's like an institutional change in like financing and regulatory regimes and even insurance companies that sit outside those whims of government. Um, yeah. Do you feel that a lot of that is more signal than you know more more noise? You know, then no. So to me, that's the signal. The signal is the deeper transformation has happened, right? Your your pricing mechanism for insurance is signaling climate risk. Your pricing mechanism for financing, when your disclosure mechanisms to secure financing at scale, is I've done my emissions. Your basic requirement to bid on a European RFP is that I have something to say on sustainability. And um, you know, without getting into politics. I kind of find it hard to believe that any side of government would be pro modern slavery and child labor. Right. We've seen this in Australia and France and in the UK who all had modern slavery acts before Canada. Changes in government have not led to rollbacks in that kind of legislation because it's not a very easy sell to your, your populace. I actually think that we should exempt companies from child labor regulations no, no politician wants to be on camera saying that. Um, right. So I, I don't think that that is going to shift. So I think that you'll always, there's always a swing, right? That's the business cycle. It's life. Things come, yeah. things go. But, but you know, the rainfall is real. The fires are real. The it's not, it's not so much a question of whether the policy tells us that we should do X or Y. Climate change is here. And how are we going to manage it? And I think people have to grapple with that. And that mm-hmm. filters through and that changes everything. Nice. Listen, you've been really generous with your time. There's been a fascinating conversation. As I said, I think there's a lot of issues that people need to know about that they don't know they need to know about. And everything just from if you are growing a business, you need to be aware that capital is now attaching conditions to that capital based on your compliance with these kinds of things. And that's not, I think a lot of small businesses who are my audience don't, aren't often aware of that. Um, but also what a, what a and fascinating growing opportunity for your business to be able to, you know, earn a living and have such a profound positive impact uh, on yeah. everything from slavery to en- environmentalism, to sustainability. Um, at, at a personal level, do you find it satisfying work? I love what I did. I love it. I mean, it's uh, it's a privilege, right? And I'm very lucky. Um, and look, it's a job. Some days it has. Some days are better than others in all jobs, right? There's no perfect job. So for any young people out there, it's great. It's not perfect. Um, I still have to spend time in QuickBooks, you know, which is life. Um, but I am very lucky to do what I do and grateful to have the chance to you know, have a little impact. And so where can people find out about you and what you do? Uh, upswingsolutions.com. We're on the, on the internet somewhere. Uh, I'm Rahul Chandran. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn or sort of all over the place, I guess. Uh, and yeah, we'd love to hear from people with opinions. Tell us where we're wrong. Always love to hear that. Um, or if anyone needs any help, just getting started on their sustainability journey. That's what, we do. That's what you do. Awesome. Thank you Thanks very, very much, much Warren. Thank you, Warren. Thanks very much. Take care.